Man, well, it is so good to see you. Are you enjoying the weather? Ah, this is why we live in Havasu, right? Great weather. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 6. Uh, we'll pick up reading in verse 27. Uh, we are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And for all of 2022, just put on your seatbelt because we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke the entire year. Now, if you did not bring a Bible with you, you're invited to use one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, under the seat in front of you, and turn to page uh, 1025. And if you're joining us online or if you're watching us, uh, listening to the podcast later on in the week, I want to invite you to uh, download the YouVersion Bible app. Go to the App Store. It's in Apple and Android. Go to the App Store, download that app, and you'll be able to follow along in our life notes and be able to read scripture and everything right there from that app. Now, as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, please take one of our Bibles home with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we believe if we read and apply God's Word, He will change our lives. And so many people are looking for God to work in their lives. So many people are hoping that God will change them or bring some type of change to them. So apply God's Word and you'll discover as you apply His Word, God's going to radically change your life. Now, for some, it's a word of caution. He might wreck your life for a little bit. He might turn your world upside down as you begin to apply it. But if you're looking for life change, apply God's word. Now, I know many of you guys know me. Uh, I'm Joe Donahue. I, my wife and I have four incredible daughters. But tonight, I'm going to focus on one of them for just, a, just a 10 seconds. Our youngest daughter, her name is Jessica. Uh, Jessica. I don't know what her name is. Thank you, Violet, sitting on the front row. Shut up. All right. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. So our youngest daughter, Jessie, she's a much like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. She's always bouncing around. She's full of energy. She's full of light. She's always happy. Uh, and she brings a lot of levity to our house at times because often she'll say something or do something that's just funny. Well, the other night as we were enjoying our family night dinner, one of my daughters started mentioning about something that happened at school and said, well, so-and-so tattled on this person. Jesse piped up immediately and said something that surprised us. She said, snitches get stitches. Which is really funny. So if, I, let me break it down for you. So in case you're not catching what that actually meant, what Jesse was saying, if you snitch on me, if you tell on me, I'm going to beat you up. Uh, if you tattletale, you're gonna get hurt. And I can just imagine, like I immediately, immediately started imagining that my daughter is part of the mafia at CCA. <laughs> and she's standing out by the chain link fence on the playground, you know, putting her fist in her hand and saying, snitches get stitches, and looking for the people that told on her. So I, I do think, though, that as we think about that phrasing, snitches get stitches, it does actually reflect how a lot of people feel today. Um, maybe we get our feelings hurt. Maybe somebody does something wrong to us. They wrong us in some way, and we immediately think, I'm going to pay them back. I'm going to get them back for what they did to me. And it may be something subtle, or it may be something like, uh, maybe if you hurt me or you hurt my feelings or if you wrong me, I'm just going to ignore you and pretend like you don't exist. Or maybe if you hurt me, maybe I will never make eye contact with you again. I'm just gonna, I'm just, well, I guess that goes along with ignoring you, right? But I'm not gonna even look your way. Or, or maybe if you hurt me, I'll smile and nod at you on the outside, but on the inside, things will never be like they once were. Our relationship will never be like it once was. Or maybe we're more vindictive. Maybe we say, hey, if this person hurts me, I'm gonna make sure everybody else knows about it. 
They, they humiliated me, so I'm going to humiliate them behind their back and I will gossip about them and I will talk about them and I'll tear them down. For those of us like that, I include me in that group sometimes. For those of us like that, we tend to think of the Old Testament passage of scripture that says, eye for an eye and a tooth for a... Right. Uh, when a toddler, think about this, when a toddler hits another toddler on the playground, most of the time that toddler is going to hit them back. And if we're correcting them, we didn't see the first hit. We say to the one that threw the second hit, why did you hit them? And they will say something like, because they hit me first, right? The toddler's not thinking about self-preservation. The toddler's not thinking about his constitutional rights to self-defense. The toddler just wants to hurt the other person because they got hurt. And as parents, as grandparents, as any person in this room that has a pulse, sometimes we struggle with paybacks as well. We struggle with paying people back when they hurt us. We may not do it overtly, but oftentimes we'll do it subtly. So if you're a follower of Jesus, how do we respond when we do get hurt by other people? How, how do we react? How do we respond? How do we pay people back when they've hurt us or humiliated us or embarrassed us? Well, Jesus taught us about that tonight in our passage of scripture. Luke chapter six, beginning in verse 27. Let's read together. Jesus said these words, but I say to you, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful." So what is Jesus trying to teach us here besides a message that really gets under our skin? Besides a message that really kind of confronts us as we are? Is Jesus teaching us that we're supposed to simply stand still and take it when we get hurt by other people? Are, are we supposed to allow evildoers to get away with the harm that they have caused to us? So as a follower of Jesus, what I want you to know is the first thing we need to understand about this passage of scripture is this, radical love overcomes hate, hurts, and humiliation. Radical love overcomes hate, hurts, and humiliation. Now, as always, anytime one of us shares, we always, well, we don't always, but we often talk about the context, how important it is to understand it. And in this context, we've got to grasp what Jesus was saying here. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, as Jesus is writing, is teaching the story, uh, the Gospel of Matthew says, Jesus said, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other as well. 
So Matthew brings a little bit more clarity to, the, to this idea of being injured, personally injured. Now, I've asked Jesse Pruitt, our worship leader, to come to the stage to help me illustrate this. So give Jesse a round of applause. Jesse. So, so here we go, right? The passage of scripture that Jesus taught from, from Matthew is, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, Offer your other one as well. Hey, Jesse. Hi. Hey, how you feeling? I'm ready. He is ready. So <laughs> here's what's interesting about this passage. Did you know that only 10% of the world's population is, is left-handed? Okay, so when Jesus was teaching this passage and he said, if someone strikes you on the right cheek or if someone takes their right hand and hits you on the right cheek, we're under the impression that someone is not going to hit with their left hand because most people who are right-handed won't choose to throw or hit with their weaker hand. You ever tried to throw a ball with your weaker hand? You look rather silly, don't you? You ever tried to write? No, so we understand Jesus is teaching that if I was going to strike Jesse on the right cheek with my dominant hand, well, that's impossible, normal swing. Because if I swing and hit him, he almost leaned into that. Did you guys see that? <laughs> if I swing and I hit him, I'm swinging and hitting his left cheek. So if I'm going to hit him with my right hand, how am I gonna do that on his right cheek? Well, I could kind of swing around like this and do a little ninja fist punch or something, right? I could come across here and swing at him like that, but that doesn't make any sense. So the way as I read this passage of scripture, understand it, if I'm going to hit Jesse on the right cheek, I'm going to reach down as hard as I can and come up and slap him across the face with the back of my hand. Jesse, which is, which is more insulting to you? Would you rather be slapped or punched? A slap. A slap. You would rather be slapped? No. No, no, your answer is no. Be no. practical. I'd rather be punched. You would rather be yeah. punched. Yeah. Give Jesse a round of applause. Tell him thank you. So, so, so here's the deal. When men know this, and, and maybe women, if you've ever been in a fight before, I know that when I have been in a fight in the past, that's middle school girls, that's middle school daughters. daughters. When I have been in a fight, I knew that if I really wanted to insult the person I was about to fight, I'd slap him across the face. That's, that's more insulting than being punched. It's almost, as though, it's almost as though I was saying, you're not worth my time and I'm not afraid of your retaliation. I'm not afraid of what you're going to do in response. So see, Jesus isn't talking about what happens if we're physically hit. Jesus is talking about how we respond when we are deeply offended by somebody else. How do we respond when we're deeply wounded or we're humiliated or we are embarrassed? Here's the message that Jesus wants you to hear. Whenever you are deeply and personally hurt, when you are devastated, when you are embarrassed and you feel so ashamed that somebody hurt you, don't pay the other person back. Don't seek revenge. Don't grumble about them. Don't make their sin public. We are called as followers of Jesus to turn the other cheek and to forgive. And then Jesus gave another illustration about, about tunics and cloaks. Now, the tunic was a, a very thin garment. It was kind of like an old fashioned nighty, and people would wear it underneath their clothing, and it would be the last level of clothing, the last layer of clothing right up against their skin. And they often, most Jewish people had actually two tunics. But the cloak was like a coat. It was an outer garment and Jewish people wore that during the day to keep the chill off or to keep the dust out of their clothes. And they also used it as a blanket during the night. 
Now, the Jewish people only had one cloak. Anything more was considered excessive. So now it gets interesting. The Old Testament law, if a person had been sued for their tunic and for their cloak, the law demanded that the tunic be returned. I'm sorry, the law allowed the tunic to be taken away, but it demanded that the cloak be returned in case a person didn't have one to sleep with at night. See, it was within the rights of every person to retain that cloak. They, they should have it. Jesus said something different. He said, if they take your cloak away, let them have it. If you take what the law says is rightfully yours, if they take it away from you, even though you have a right to something, Jesus says, let them have it. As followers of Jesus, you and I need to, need to be willing to lay down our rights and our expectations so other people can be blessed. As followers of Jesus, we have to come in second place to all the people around us. We have to live with the mindset that everything you and I are entitled to, everything we've worked hard for, is in reality entitled to other people because God owns it all. And that's difficult. That's a difficult thing to do, but that is actually what Jesus is calling us to do. That's radical love. That's loving our neighbor as ourself. And then Jesus goes on to explain why, as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to treat other with forgiveness and with radical love. And the reason is this, God loves the unthankful and the wicked. And by the way, that's me. God loves the unthankful and the wicked, and that's me. See, the reason we're supposed to be kind to those who hurt us and humiliate us and hate us is because God is kind to them. God loves them. God cares for them. And if God loves and cares for people who have hurt you, we need to do the same. Look at verse 35. Jesus is very clear. He says, love your enemies. Do good to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Now, if you're visiting here today for the first time, you might find it strange that the pastor would say, God loves the wicked. God loves the unthankful. And yet that's exactly what God does. Does, does God love the righteous? Yes. God loves the holy people? Yes. God loves followers of Jesus? Yes. It's all true. But God loves and shows kindness to even those people who don't believe in him. God loves and God shows kindness to terrorists, to murderers, to abusers. God shows kindness to people who are not kind to others. God shows kindness to people who are mean and cruel. Now at Calvary, one of our core values is called uncomfortable grace. We believe that followers of Jesus should show the same limitless grace that they have also received from God. That means we demonstrate radical love. That means we don't pay back evil for evil. That means we don't seek to hurt other people who have hurt us. We go out of our way to demonstrate God's grace in such a way it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. And it makes those around us maybe a little bit uncomfortable because we're forgiving those who don't deserve it. We're forgiving those who are unthankful. We're forgiving those who are mean. We're forgiving people who never apologize and are cruel, yet we forgive anyway. That's radical love. 
we love others and we forgive our enemies in such a way that we see them without one single fault. That's hard to do. That we look at other people who have hurt us as though they've never hurt us before. We look at other people that we would consider our enemies and say, you know what? I don't see them without a single fault. I I don't see a single fault in their lives any longer. You know that's the same way that God sees you, right? You, You know that you and I were the worst of the worst. You and I were sinner upon sinner until the grace of Jesus changed our lives, until we surrendered our lives to Jesus. And that moment that we surrendered our lives to Jesus, we were changed. And God now looks at us without a single fault. Paul provides this passage of scripture in Colossians 1. As he's writing to the Colossian church, he said, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now... He has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. See, you were God's enemy, but God showed forgiveness and kindness to you. You now stand in God's presence without one single fault. You stand before his presence without one single thing wrong with you. No faults, no sin, no character flaws. And Paul's not talking past tense. If, if you've come to a point where you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you've received Christ as your savior, if you've understood that Jesus paid the price for your sin, you're in God's presence now from God's perspective without a flaw because of what Jesus did. He erased your debt. He took your sin upon him and he's made you new. And as a follower of Jesus, because of God's kindness We want to forgive our enemy in such a way when they are in our presence, we see them without a single fault. That means we don't ignore them. We don't talk over them. We don't talk around them. It means we don't try to pay them back with some business deal. It means we see them without a single blemish. That's uncomfortable grace. That's difficult. Yet that's the passage that Jesus is teaching to us. That's the point that Jesus is passing on to us now. So what you and I need to do is simple. It's act like a child and love like your daddy. That's it. Act like a child and love like your daddy. Let's go back to the, uh, the illustration Uh, Jesus said, look, Luke 6, 35, you'll be acting as children of the most high or as a son of the most high. When we think about the way that children or at least toddlers interact with each other, one minute, two kids will be fighting or will be playing together on the playground. They'll be laughing and they'll be having a good time. And then someone takes someone's truck and then they're fighting and they're getting into it. And whether whether they're rolling around in the dirt, whether they're yelling at each other, And then the next second later, they're playing again and they're laughing again and they're having a good time and they're reconnecting through the way that they're interacting. They would rather play and fight. I'm sorry, they would rather play and laugh than argue and fight. They find value in the friendship of one another. And regardless of how they hurt, they forgive quickly. That's how we all need to be. See, we all need to forgive quickly. We all need to not carry grudges. We need to just act like God. Act like a kid, forgive like a kid, and really love the way that God loves. 
Love like your daddy. Look at verse 32. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Jesus is telling us that even selfish, self-centered people without Jesus can be nice and giving to those who are kind and nice and forgiving to them. Jesus says, look, it's not hard to be nice when people are nice. But it is hard to be nice. It is hard to be kind when we've been hurt. And that's what we're called to do. That's how we're called to live. So spouses, forgive one another. Don't hold grudges. Parents, is there something that you need to forgive that your children have done? Forgive them. Don't hold things over their head. Do you have a coworker that you just don't get along with because of something they did to you in the past? Forgive them. Write them a card, write them a letter, shoot them an email text and just say, I'm sorry, I've been carrying a grudge. As followers of Jesus, we're called to act like our heavenly father and be kind to those who are not kind, to be kind to others. See, only selfish people are nice to those who are nice to them. Only selfish people love those who show love to them. Only selfish people pray for those who pray for them. Only selfish people give to those who give to them. Only selfish people forgive if people forgive them. Only selfish people are interested in forgiving and showing kindness to other people who are showing that to them. But, but we're not called to be selfish. We're called to be selfless as followers of Jesus. That's the mark that Jesus has on our life is love for everybody. See, the more we learn to love others and the more we learn to care for others, the less you're gonna be offended by them. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 8, most important of all, continue to show deep love for one another for love covers a multitude of sins. So let's be like our heavenly father. Let's act like children. Let's love like our daddy. Let's forgive others quickly and love deeply. Let's be more like our heavenly father who created us. Let's show uncomfortable grace to those who have hurt us, humiliate us, or to those who hate us. Let's be a people that we're called to be. Because if we wanna reach our community around us with the hope of Jesus, we gotta live differently. And we gotta love those who have hurt us and offended us and betrayed us and show kindness to those who don't deserve it. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for a difficult passage of scripture for us to follow. Lord, we want to confess and we want to acknowledge that it's hard to show and demonstrate the same type of forgiveness and compassion that you show to us. And that's why we're dependent upon your spirit. That's why we're dependent upon your Holy Spirit bearing fruit in our lives. That the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control would pour out of our hearts and lives as we interact with other people, especially those who have hurt us. God, help us to be grace-filled, graceful followers of Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.